Okay, today I have Sean again on the phone and he's he's dialed in so hopefully this works. We're gonna see if this actually works. Um, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing one of my massive commutes home so hopefully the sound quality's not horrible. Yeah, we're trying to do like uh, multitasking even though we're not supposed to be multitasking. But anyways, <laughs> we're gonna try it. Um, today's topic is like we're gonna kind of go backwards even though we probably should have started we kind of did kind of touch on it on the first couple and we right through actually it's it's the theme of like the self-love and why things are important and we're gonna talk today about actually why counseling or therapy is important and um, so you know we we mentioned earlier too that Sean took a long time to actually come for counseling, even though he contemplated it for a long, long time and he know he knew he needed to get counseling. But we wanna talk about sort of why it is important and not to seek it when you're in that dark space, but to kind of like be proactive. Okay, Sean, take it away. Um, from my point of view, anyway, um, counseling is incredibly important because it teaches you the kind of coping skills or the lessons you need to learn in order to catch yourself. Are you still there? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> sorry. My, my, my computer, like the dash on my phone's or her, uh, car's being all funny. Anyway, sorry about that, guys. Um, <laughs> it teaches you the coping skills you need. Um, so that when you do start to get into a healthier mindset, you understand that, you know, you're going to have days where you are going to slip back into, you know, some negative thoughts or whatever that may be. That's just being human. Emotions are fluctuating. They're fluid. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. The difference is you're going to be able to recognize a bad day as just a bad day and not a potential slip into the chaotic darkness that you potentially are used to residing in. So you're able to stop yourself or you're able, you're able to clue in to telltale signs within yourself um, that allow you to understand that it's time to, you know, do something that makes you really happy or take a step back from the situation or um, even, even right now for me personally, I've been having a lot of friction at work with my dad. Um, and, you know, I'm getting close to setting the boundaries of maybe him and I don't need to work hand in hand anymore. And we need a little break because it's just a lot. It's, you know, 40 hours a week side by side. It's, it's a very difficult relationship to maintain. Um, so before that, you know, little work animosity builds into like a resentment. Like for me, I'm recognizing now that I need to take a step back from that situation and, you know, maybe not work hand in hand with it. And honestly, I, I wouldn't have had the courage or the mental fortitude to pick up on that without therapy. I would have just allowed it to go to a point where eventually there would be a huge blowout. Him and I probably wouldn't talk for a couple of weeks. Then, you know, we would even eventually we, we would start talking again, but we would never have a conversation about what the issues were. You know, I don't allow that stuff to happen anymore because I've gone through therapy, because I've learned um, how to respect myself and how to establish boundaries, because it's very easy to teeter into a negative state of mind. So let's just try to use all the tools to maintain a really healthy, happy lifestyle and set those boundaries when we need to. I think that's a really good um, uh, that you mentioned about boundaries because I think that seems sometimes to be um, an issue, right? Like where, you know, depending on, you know, I guess childhood trauma or certain certain incidences that you people think boundaries are like a negative thing, but it's actually very healthy. I think um, it's a very, very difficult skill to learn. And I have, in no regards, mastered it at all, um, but I'm working towards it. And, and I think the ability to recognize 
um, within your own personal relationships when you need to set boundaries with somebody is a massive skill to have. Uh, because I think a lot of people take for granted their own mental health and I think they take for granted the fact that the onus is all on them. I think people don't necessarily realize that they can kind of pick up on what other people are going through. You know, somebody might be really nasty to them. That could just be their own mental health. That could be them having a really rough day. Uh, so being able to establish those boundaries or being able to have those conversations, those difficult conversations with people, um, that will go a long, long way in kind of safeguarding your own mental space. Um, just because it, it's a lot of self-respect that goes into that. Um, and, and, you know, therapy is going to help you do that in a, many, many ways. For me, like, the one of the biggest was just actually opening up in therapy and talking about stuff without feeling judged allowed me to kind of pick up on that skill and have that skill transition into my everyday life. Um, where now if somebody has anything they want to ask me about my mental health, I'm always very transparent about it, even if it's, you know, something that I used to hold as, you know, a really big insecurity or something that uh, doesn't necessarily make me look like the best person in the world. I'm always very honest and transparent with it because for me, the more I bring these issues to light, the less power they have over me. So it goes that way with setting boundaries as well. If somebody's really bothering you or, you know, one little thing is messing with you, you just have a conversation. It will go a long, long way. And if that person is not able to respect your boundaries, that's when you can kind of move forward into realizing, like, are they really a healthy person to have in your life? Because if, if they can respect your boundaries, you know, that's a friendship that's probably going to last a very long time. But if they have a hard time respecting that, then for your own personal growth, it might be a good idea to kind of slowly ease out of that friendship. I don't know. What do you think about that? I think that's so true. Like, uh, you know, um, and I, a good conversation is like, I, I always bring it back to like actual, you know, what I've gone through. So, um, you know, depending on how you were raised, like I was raised in a very strict environment. My parents were, you know, we, I was raised in that era where children were seen and, um, and then not heard. And you really couldn't advocate for yourself. Like, you know, it, it was whatever your parents says goes. And so I had to actually learn how to speak up for myself and, you know, and say no. Like, it was so hard to learn to say no. Like, you know, I would feel guilty if, if I said no. So, but that's the actual trauma response, right? Like, you know, where you try to people please. So it's so necessary to set boundaries even in that way where, you know, you you're, you cannot, if somebody asks you to do something and, you know, you're so, you just, you're so afraid to just say, no, you know, I really can't, I really can't do that. Like, I would love to do that. So I've had to actually learn, that's an, another boundary of saying, like, no. Or, like, as you said, I need, like, a mental break from this person. So I'm going to kind of step back for a little bit. I'm going to just, you know, take a little break. Or it's okay sometimes if, you, if you've had that conversation and, you know, that person, you know, has to come out of your circle now and just becomes part of your square. You know, that's also all healthy boundaries. And there's nothing wrong with that. You have to protect your mental health at all costs. And I think we don't recognize those little things like we we tend to think of mental health as oh depression like a, a like a symptom right like mental illness we we, we kind of coincide mental health and mental illness but all of these tools and strategies are actually mental health right like it's it's making instead of like physical health you're you're training your your mental capabilities and that's what I think is probably the most proactive thing you can do. I agree completely. I think, um, you know, back to the boundary setting or something like that. I mean, as 
for my example, because uh, you've been very honest about, you know, kind of your background in that. For my example of my father, like, love the man to death, but we're, it's just we're getting so close. Like, it's so close at work now where we're starting to butt heads. So the ability to foresee the fact that, you know, this could potentially become a problem with somebody that I care about, do I want to allow, allow it to escalate? Or, you know, can I redirect while we're still at like a number four or a five out of 10? Do you know what I mean? So like, I can redirect, redirect, I'll get somebody to kind of cover my position at work and I'll go do something else, which isn't a huge deal for me. I'm lucky enough in that regard. And then, you know, we can have a little bit of space and time to kind of reset on that. And I think it's, you know, it's about setting boundaries, it's your mental health, but it's also a lot of people don't talk about stress. I feel like stress is kind of forgotten in the mental health uh, genre a little bit, at least with a lot of the people I talk to about in any way. And people don't really understand what stress can do. So for me personally, I don't handle stress overly well, and I have a very high stress job. So I start to kind of spiral a little bit and the starting point for me is always stress. So I'll get so stressed out, then the depression comes in and then once the depression kind of takes root, that's where like a real snowball effect happens. You know, stress on top of depression, on top of this, on top of that, and it starts to get really nasty. So if I'm in a good place, typically when I start getting super stressed out, that's a really good indicator for me that's like, well, okay, like it's a good time to take a step back. Let's see what's triggering this. Let's see if, if there's anything that's, you know, a quick fix or something that I can do immediately to change the circumstances. And then we can kind of, once that's kind of dialed in a little bit, we can kind of take a deep dive into why is it triggering me? How am I being triggered from it? Um, and kind of work through those issues a little bit. Is it, is it something that I need to work on personally, or is it somebody in my vicinity that's just incredibly disrespectful, or kind of a deeper dive into what's going on? But I always try to go to kind of a, a quick little patch job just to kind of make sure I don't completely crumble, and that allows me the freedom and the space to kind of take a deep dive into something. Um, so for me, yeah, I need I need to have that conversation. It's probably gonna have it's probably gonna happen tomorrow, to be honest. Um, and then Wednesday, I'll be taking a step back from my role and and moving forward like that. Because it's just, those boundaries need to be set. And it's just one of those things that, you know, not enough people are willing to talk about. They, they're scared to offend somebody or, you know, they're scared for their job or whatever it may be. But I think, especially in your personal lives, you need to understand that if people aren't willing to respect the simple thing that you're asking for, then like really... You should probably stop holding so much space for their opinions. Exactly, but then here, here that's a, a a good topic of unsolicited opinions, <laughs> like. Oh yeah, well there's <laughs> there's another one. I mean, I I come from a. My family's relatively easygoing, but we, you know, you and I have been discussed this in the past, but we were both kind of raised with the mentality, you know, get a good job, get a pension, benefits, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I didn't realize this until really like the last year or two, but how much I look to my parents for their acceptance and what I'm doing in my life. And it's, I'm not going to lie. Like as I go down this kind of personal growth journey and, and you know, I've done a lot of therapy and I've done a lot of talking and I'm starting to kind of throw the fog, pull out who I want to be and who I really am as a person. I'm starting to realize that like, me looking for their approval is something that is stressing me out and kind of is starting to push me down a path that I don't want to go anymore. So now I'm having the internal conflict of like, I want to do, you know, a career change or I want to do this. And in the back of my head, I always have to go, oh, well, are they going to be okay with this? Oh, are they going to approve? And I'm starting to realize slowly now that I'm like, I don't need their approval. This is my life. I get to live it the way I want to live it. Well, so, mm-hmm. I would, I would have never had the skills to kind of slowly pick that out of myself without going to therapy. And I think that's, uh, I think that's um, a, a necessary conversation because I think people have this vision 
of you sit there and you're on this couch and you're just talking and that alone is kind of like you know a same thing opening up but it, it's it's sort of like like a gym membership i guess so you know you pick a gym based on your needs for your physical health right like you're not gonna you know some people like uh planet fitness because of the simplicity of it but some people want good life or some people want a home gym that's just like therapy it's it's not a one size fit fits all you're gonna have to find a, a counselor or a therapist that works with you that's a good fit that you feel comfortable with and like you know i think the first step is just to kind of like seek it out and you don't have to wait till there's like a, a serious issue in your life to seek it out like sometimes a lot of it and as sean can attest is just conversations and then you know hopefully if you get a good therapist or counselor that person is sort of like your like your own life coach your personalized life coach helping you and providing you some tools and some strategies that you can use and kind of like just cheering you on the way to be your best self, right? And, I, I agree completely with that, completely. And if that's not working, like if you do have like therapy or counseling and you're not finding those results, again, just like it, boundaries you could say you know what this is probably not a good fit i just you know i'm in the same space because it it's sort of i always i i i speak of counseling like a i don't know how do i explain it i guess i guess like a gym membership you you get out what you put in right it's work you can't you can't just go to the gym and just stand there and get fit oh, I, I agree. <laughs> Like I think there's there's a certain level of work. Like it's it's kind of like an equation, right? So if you want it to be as effective as it can be, there's a couple things that you kind of need to to get an A plus on. So you need to be able to put in the work, and you need to really want to be able to put in the work. That's number one. Number two, actually, I wouldn't even necessarily say that's number one. I think number one for me is really finding a counselor that you feel comfortable with and a counselor that isn't going to sugarcoat it for you. I mean, somebody that's going to call you on your crap and, and be honest with you and ask those really difficult questions and get you thinking. And then if you have that in the combination of you really willing to put in the work, that's when I think you're going to start seeing some really great results. I think a lot of people are open to the idea of counseling they go to a counselor it's probably not the best fit or a therapist it's probably not the best fit and you know they, they don't get anywhere they're in it for a year two years three years however long and they're still in the same space change the equation try somebody different try somebody that's going to ask slightly different questions try somebody that's going to try you know different techniques with you it's well, you know it's not a one size fits all like you say there's there's a bunch of variables that are going to go into creating the best experience possible well, I also, and I'm not shunning on, you know, people who have benefits and access their benefits, but benefits are capped, right? Like, unless you have like a, I don't know, a super pension, uh, benefit plan. Um, and if, again, if you're only going to therapy because you have benefits, um, well, would you go, people join gyms and work out, but they don't have benefits, like nobody pays you back for that. So I just yeah. find like, it's also an investment, like this ROI, the return on investment, you should apply to yourself as well. So if, if you're willing to aesthetically on the outside look good, you should probably want to be, look just as good on the inside and feel good on the inside. And I think there's, there's something to be said on people who um, personally invest in their mental health and I'm, again, I'm not shunning that if you have benefits, obviously use your benefits, but some benefit packages do not cover, sometimes not even certain, certain counseling modalities. And other things are that they're capped at ridiculous prices, like 250 I've heard per person, like 
you know, if you're going to base it on that, well, you're deaf and then you're going to say, well, I can't, I can't afford, um, counseling. You can't afford not to get counseling. And if you have somebody, somebody, I'm pretty sure your therapist will work with you within your budget. A lot of therapists offer sliding scales. Like it shouldn't be the detriment for you to get help is what I'm saying. If you can afford coffee every day and there's certain things that you skip the dishes and there's certain things that you can't well, live without, I'm pretty sure you can afford counseling. I agree. I mean, there's there's multiple ways to look at it. So like, like you said earlier, try not to go to therapy when you're in that really, really dark space, okay? Like if you're in that dark space and you're willing to go to therapy, absolutely do it. Good for you. It's really difficult to do. But the trick for a lot of people, and most people, myself included, they don't realize this, is if you can go to therapy when you're in you know, a slightly healthier, better mindset, and you do that kind of prerequisite work, so you, you know what I mean? You want to get there so that you're able to tackle these issues before they come severe problems. So, you know, you got to look at it as therapy is the greatest means for you to be able to learn more about yourself. Well, so you're, you're going to learn more about, you know, what upsets you, why it upsets you. Um, and, and these are all really powerful things to know. So like, it's going to help you progress in your career, in your life, in your romantic life, in every aspect of your world will get better. The more educated you are on who you are as a human being and what affects you. Well, I, I find it, and this is another area to, to speak about. Like, so you, you get clients that, you know, they're, they're, you know, actively coming and they're feeling good. And then, then they're like, okay, well, I'm good after like maybe five sessions. And it's like, well, yeah, but, you know, would you go to the gym just for five, just because, you know, you see uh, like some results? Yeah, you're feeling good because you probably have, have applied those strategies. But I, I don't. Well, there's, there's, there's a couple ways to look at it too. So like, I remember my first couple sessions. Like, I left actually feeling like a little high. Like, I felt like massive, like dopamine, serotonin release. And for me, it was just being able to vent, unjudgingly, just getting a whole bunch of stuff off my chest. Like, I felt a lot lighter after. But I think for my own personal journey anyway, like it always kind of gets darker before it gets better. Cause you kind of got to go through a lot of the stuff that's bothering you and kind of understand it before you come out the other side. So it's almost like a placebo effect. If you're, you know what I mean? If you go for a couple sessions in therapy, you're like, I feel fantastic. I'm done. Ah, I'm a little hesitant to believe that <laughs> personally, personally, like it's like a placebo. It's like, okay, cool, you got to vent about all your problems and you feel great because somebody's understanding and somebody's listening to you. But, like, have you worked through any of those problems? Like, actively work through them? Or have you just implied, you know, a couple skills that you've learned to help cope with them? Because I, I doubt you're able to actually work through a lot of that stuff that quickly. If you are, good for you. But few and far between, in my opinion. Well, I find... If, if that happens, I, it's because you, exactly what you said, you're on that dopamine high and that serotonin high, but you also are probably, whatever was the, the, the initial concern, you, you have a distraction. And that's what's keeping you in that kind of like a feel good. You've just adopted some sort of distraction where you were actually kind of like in your feelings because you have to be yeah. in your feelings this is a whole is, the only way is through right so yeah it's it's, yeah. it's uncomfortable and it's 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 not like when you're working through it as you know it's it gets dark and it gets like okay and remember you started running like you have to have an outlet, a healthy outlet. Oh yeah, I was I when I was going through some of the, like the darker stuff, like I was seriously running, and I, I was just using it as like a clear my head escape, really. And like it was fantastic for me. It really helped me kind of get through some of the 
the really weird transition periods. Um, that was really good. But yeah, I mean, most of the people I've talked to that have done like serious therapy and have come out, you know, enlightened or somewhat healthier on the other side, uh, most of them agree that it, it tends to get kind of darker before it gets better. And that's because like, if you're going to therapy and you feel fantastic after the first couple sessions, like you're in the honeymoon phase of your relationship with, with therapy. Right, everything's great. You love it. Everything's beautiful. You know, nobody's really upset anybody yet. You know, everything's great. But eventually, you're gonna get into the realm of like, okay, there's some serious questions that need to be asked, and you can't just avoid them anymore. You're gonna have to really start working through it. So, once that honeymoon phase kind of fades out a little bit, and you really have to start understanding, like, if you want this relationship to work, you're gonna have to put in the effort. You know, that's where you're gonna start seeing some really great results if you're willing to put it on. Exactly. I think that's the main thing. Like, it's a commitment. It's it's sort of like a contract. It's a, a contract, but it's with yourself, really. You're making a contract with yourself. Yeah, so absolutely. If, if it took you 51 years or 50 years or 40 years or 28 years or 20 years to get to therapy, Chances are it's not gonna you're it's not gonna be done in five sessions or six sessions. Like, no, I think personally, I think it's a it should realistically be on some scale or another a lifelong thing. Yeah. So, like for us, for example, like we haven't really had a session in a little while. Um, but I mean, if anything in my life comes up that is is triggering me and bothering me, like you're gonna be my first phone call. Exactly. Because I'm going to have somebody that I can really talk to, that I can really weigh the options, that, you know, is on my side, that's not going to sugarcoat anything for me and, you know, help me, help me get through it. Um, mind you, let's I'm preface gonna... this by saying Sean was a weekly client for at least 10 months minimum, I think. Yeah, I think we're, yeah, 10, almost a year. Yeah, almost a year. So that's going from that to that, so... And the only reason, too, is because we do these segments, so we talk a lot I mean, I mean to, to be fair, we do talk a lot anyway, so yeah. you're completely up to date on exactly. everything that's going on in life. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, if, if I want, if I'm in a position where, you know, I'm in a, it's, it's interesting, because I want to use the word selfish, but it's not selfish, but if I'm in, this, in the place where I'm like, I need some time where I, we can have a conversation that's solely revolving around what's going on in my life, and you know we can we can come up with a plan or we can work through it or you know we can dive into what's triggering me or whatever it may be then like you know i'm going to call you immediately immediately and set an appointment because i know now that if i let stuff fester and i i just leave it and i'm like oh it will get better it doesn't it just grows it's like a tumor right so those negative thoughts they're like tumors they just kind of grow they get worse and then they create other symptoms and so, like, it's just better to deal with it as fast as possible. So, yeah, big fan. I tell everybody to go to therapy. Anybody that asks me, I'm like, yeah, I'm in therapy, and you should be in therapy, too. Because, like, there's <laughs> no value. There's it, To me, it's crazy. Like, the amount of value you can put into knowing who you are and, you know, really getting to know yourself intimately, I mean – there's nothing that can stop you like once you have those skills you know it's amazing how easy life becomes it really is like you start to realize that you got in your own way 95% of life well I just find you know people struggle with like even when you, and this is an ongoing thing so it's obviously the root cause of a lot of things because again we, we say that too we were taught so many things but not how to love ourselves and why it's so important and 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 yet when you ask the average person hey do you love yourself nobody can answer that question very few people can say yeah i do you know people are always talking about they can't be well they can't be alone right and and you have to think the average person is inundated with technology so they're never technically alone 
like with their own with their own thoughts like like how you can just go running right yeah like no yeah very very few people like most connected society in history that's the least connected yeah like we're so disconnected yeah we're so disconnected from each other and ourselves but you know i can tell you what you know john doe did from my high school who i haven't talked to in 15 years i can tell you what he did on saturday yeah, because no we saw it on social media. You know, uh, yeah, I saw oh, it yeah. on Instagram. I haven't spoken to him in ages, but I know what he ate for Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, I find it it's really it's really quite interesting. Hello, are you there? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I had some technical difficulties with my my phone just disconnected and reconnected to Bluetooth very quickly. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting, and, and you know, I did, I've done, through, you know, a decent amount of therapy as well, and it's a question that I still struggle with, and I'm more than willing to admit that, you know, do I love myself? Honestly, right now, I love myself more than I have in a very long time. Um, do I love who I am completely? Probably not, but do I love the direction I'm going? Yes, absolutely. So... You know, it's for me. It's kind of a sliding scale. Like I'm, I'm making progress on it, and I'm, I'm able to recognize the things that I wasn't so fond of, and I'm working on those. So, it's interesting. It's, it's a very simple question with very complex answers. That's right. And for, for, for me, it could be different for everybody, right? No, but for I me, think, that's I what think, I think there are, you know, people unless they if they're going to be completely honest. I don't know how many people would admit, like, the truth of that. But yeah, it seems I, 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 it seems concurrent in in my practice that you know you could ask that question, and a lot of people can't really ultimately answer that question, or they know that they don't, or they ask me how, and it's hilarious because self love is really a selfish journey like I can't tell you how to love yourself I can tell you how you're not loving yourself right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> all those big red flags that are <laughs> waving in the air I mean for me it's really quite interesting um with my my new partner because she she grew up in a very entre- like entrepreneur family where her and I the the disconnect on career choices it's not necessarily a disconnect because I'm very slowly kind of drifting towards um, her line of thinking a little bit like uh, my I'm allowing myself to evolve and I'm slowly you know shedding the constricting thought process that was placed on me by my parents in a very loving way but like it's still very restricting Um, and like I tell her, I'm like, hey, maybe, uh, you know, I got home the other day, I'm like, maybe I'll go sell Teslas. You know, there's a job opening selling Teslas. And she's like, cool, go do it. And I'm like, uh, do you want to know how much it makes? She's like, I don't really care how much it makes. And I'm like, uh, oh, oh, okay. My, my brain doesn't do that. My brain's like, how am I going to financially support everybody? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? And for her, she's like, if you enjoy it, go do it. We'll just change our lifestyle. But that's, that's and what people are afraid of doing. Like, they don't, yeah, it, they don't understand it, that we, we, we change, like, everything is, is money for time, right? Everything is money for time. And you have to figure out what the value of your time is. And that's all you have to figure out. Those are the keys. It's not, it, I agree completely. And it's, the valuation cannot just be income potential. No, it has to be, you know, you have to incorporate, you know, stress loads, something, you know, does your job bring you some level of joy? Like, do you genuinely enjoy going to work? That's why you have to put it for money for time because your time should be priceless, right? I, I, I agree completely. So when you're putting a dollar amount for that priceless because we only have a limited amount of that working time let's put working time where you're physically able to work in this life right yep 
So that's where you have to figure out. And once you do that, you can figure out what your return on investment is. What is your value, and which is money, for your time? What, what does that break down to? And if you're, because like you have to, add, remember how we, we, were, we were saying you have to do it backwards? You can't just look at the, the paper amount that you make. You have to put in your time, right? You have to factor in your commute. You have to factor in stress. You have to factor in actual working time, like that time. And then you really figure out what that dollar amount is for your time. And then, yeah, you, I, then when you do that, you'll be you, that changes. That is a paradigm shift. That changes everything. Once yeah, you do so that, for me, like I do, I'm I'm crazy. Okay, so I moved to Aurelia, which I don't. If for whoever's listening, if you know where Barry is, it's about 25 minutes north of Barry. And I commute to the GTA every day, so I'm a minimum of three hours of driving a day. Yeah, I'm not minimum. doing that. I'm telling you right yeah. now. Yeah, minimum. And some, sometimes I'm upwards of four. Oh. I'm two hours in the morning, I'm two hours at night. So when I when I do my, you know, I reverse everything. I take my commute into effect. I take my hourly wages. You know, I take, uh, for me personally, I'm a union member. So I have to pay union dues. And there, there, you know, there's a lot of stuff along those lines. And I break it down to, you know, deduct my gas for all my driving, my hours of driving, all that stuff. You know, I make significantly less than what I see on my paycheck. In all reality, I make significantly less. My dollar figure is 50% of what I thought it was. Um, and then my job is incredibly stressful on top of that. So that it just becomes very difficult to maintain and do because I start thinking like, well, hey, like I can get a job, you know, making, you know, let's say 60% of what I make right now and I could drive 15 minutes to work. Why not? So it's a really interesting, and, and for me, like, I, I know on one of the earlier podcasts, we had kind of discussed like what our dream jobs would be and all that stuff. I really don't know. I, I still don't know. Um, and something that I've really been the paradigm shift for me is, I've been having a lot of stress over picking a new career. Um, and like just recently I've decided that I think I'm just gonna do a couple random jobs over the next couple years in different fields and see what I enjoy. But that's the best like, way. I, and, that, that's yeah, the best like, way. It's such a simple solution to such an easy, you know what I mean? It's so simple, but like my brain took forever to get there. Cause like, I'm still trying to deal with the programming of, you know, you need a high paying job, you need to be successful, you need this. I'm like, you know what, I just wanted to do something that like doesn't make me senile and like I actually enjoy doing. So, you know, may that be a job in sales, may it be, you know, insurance, whatever, whatever it may be, whatever it may be. I'm just going to start doing random beginner entry level jobs, take a massive pay cut, see what I enjoy. And if I find a field that I do enjoy, then it's like, okay, like, let me actively put some effort into making this into a career. And once I decided on doing that, like, my stress on finding a new job was completely gone. All the pressure was off. All of it. Because I understood that, like, the next job doesn't need to be my last job. It's not going to be my last job. It's just going to be a job. Exactly. So, like, I think a lot of... And, and, you know, I would have never, never got to that, even though it took me a while to get there, don't get me wrong, but I would have never got to that state of mind without therapy. There's no way. I wouldn't have the courage to leave my job right now. I wouldn't have the courage to tell my dad I need some space. You know what I mean? You would still be in your relationship, your previous relationship. Yeah, Yeah, I would still be in my previous relationship, not happy, stressed to the nines, you know, overweight just miserable absolutely miserable just waiting just waiting for something to change but never actually doing anything about it well that's what that's that's um 80 of the population like yeah just waiting for this miracle to happen and doing zero work or initiating any type of change right yeah i know i know i agree and like i'm getting to the point right now where like with my current partner 
I'm like, man, I have a really bad day at work. And she, she's like, I don't even want to hear about it. And yeah. I'm like, uh, and she's like, honestly, she's like, unless you're willing to do something about it, she's like, shut up. I don't care. And I'm like, yeah, okay. You know what? That's fair. That's fair. You've listened about it for, you know, a couple months. You've well, listened I, to me. I, for, I, forgot to add, I, I forgot to add that in. Like when you're doing that calculation, you have to calculate the time you spend venting about it outside of work. Oh yeah. No, and and exactly. add that in. It's like all of this is stress. Like all of this is taking away from the joy you could be feeling in life. Well, you know what they they say. You know, we believe a lot of the you know the, the um, universe and whatever you want to believe, God or whatever you want to call it, spirituality or religion, whatever. We believe that you know you're gonna they're gonna keep showing you like reasons until you make the change, right? It's like. I'm a, yeah, I'm a firm believer in that. I believe you relive the same lessons until you've actually learned the lesson. Right. And so you know, if, you're, if you're expecting a change or like you're thinking, okay, you know, they're just going to be like, no, because they, they keep trying to redirect you. No, because life isn't supposed to be like that. You're supposed to be, that's why they always say, do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life, right? Yeah, I agree. And I mean, you know, there's there's realistic expectations too. Like, you know, it's just you just gotta like enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like, just just enjoy it. And you know, you relive the same lessons. Like, we've had this conversation numerous times. I mean, I think a lot of people could look at their love lives and really take note of this because, like, more than likely you've dated the same person but in different ways, like well, twenty I, times. I actually, you know what I mean? I actually, Why do I keep going through? I said that to a client. I go, it's the same person, just they have different names. Yeah, like you're, you're dating the exact same personality, characteristic traits, all that kind of stuff, and your relationships keep ending the same way. You, like, obviously, you, there's a lesson you need to learn here. Um, but, like, that goes, that's just a very basic example, but, like, that goes for, in my opinion, a lot of elements of life. Like, if you, I mean, if you keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, I mean, you're a little insane, right? So you need to be able to look at yourself objectively and, you know, learn some lessons and move forward. And therapy helps with that. It helps open your eyes to be able to see the patterns. And you said, you mentioned something and I want to piggyback on that because you just brought that relationship thing up. And and because like anything, we can use that analogy for, for, for anything. Realize and recognize no matter what you do, there's a honeymoon stage and that's not the best time to make, be making long-term decisions during that honeymoon stage like Absolutely. as they said you know oh i feel good and in therapy that's the honeymoon stage right this this is um not to completely change topics but my partner and i've had the conversation numerous times where she asked me like is it the job or is it the people yeah so she, she goes, can you do this job with a different company in a different crew? And my answer is literally always, yes, I could for a few months. Exactly. And it's, it's because it would be, okay, this is new. This is fun. I get to meet new people. Let's do some different stuff. Honeymoon phase. But after the honeymoon phase is worn out, I'm still doing something I don't want to do. So like those emotions are going to start sneaking back in. Those feelings are going to start sneaking back in. And I told her, I'm like, in six months to a year, we'll be having the exact same conversation. So is it worth me trying that? Or do we just cut our losses now and move forward? And, you know, her and I have had that conversation back and forth. And, you know, we've had it numerous times. And it's just, it's a very interesting element that, like, people never take into consideration that, that honeymoon phase. Like, anytime you start something new, it's going to be fun and exciting. But after a few months, that's the real test, right? Like, are you willing to put in the work and do you still enjoy it? Well, here's another thing I just thought of too. Like when, when clients are coming and I ask them, do you love yourself and whatever? And, you know, well, take a loved one, whether if you have a child or you're, you don't have a child or somebody that you care about, like you're, what, whoever you care about, would you give that same, the same advice, the same, the same thing that you're doing, would you tell that person to do? Like, 
if somebody yeah. if somebody told you the exact same issue that they're telling like you're telling me I say would you give that advice to that loved one and the answer is always no so it's so simple that you don't love yourself as much as you love somebody else like why aren't you as just as well, I think I, I don't know if you and I have had this conversation um I, I'm gonna I'm gonna absolutely butcher this like but the, I believe there was an article or a study done that the average person actually treats their pets better than they treat themselves I believe it. so yeah so I believe the article was uh, based on um, taking like prescribed medications like after a surgery or something along the lines of that well like if you bring your dog in for your for example to get fixed you're, the average person is very diligent with the medication. Like they love their dog, they want their dog to be safe, they want their dog to be okay. They're going to take the advice of an expert, but they're not willing to put in the same effort with themselves. And it's a very interesting dynamic because that spreads across all elements of their life. Right? Yeah. You're much more likely to take care of somebody you love than you are yourself. Right. And it's a scary, it's a scary thought. Like being compassionate to those people you love. But I mean, if you don't take care of yourself, are you going to be able to be there for them in the capacity that you want to be able to be there for them? Well, I always... It's a really interesting... I always say that. If you don't love yourself, how do you love somebody else? Like, what are you basing it off of? That's oh, my... completely. That's the thing. Like, I, I... So, it's obviously a void. So, whatever you're, you're missing in yourself, you're looking for that other person to to fill oh yeah you're you're well at that point not to take anything away from anybody's relationships but it's it's very possible that you know you are overly dependent on that person to make you happy whereas if you are in a very positive happy mental state and you're doing well and you're working on yourself you know it takes a lot more work for somebody to be allowed the potential to compromise that. So you're going to be a lot more selective on your partners. You're going to be a lot more demanding of your partners because you're going to need somebody that compliments you because you are, you know, a very complete and put together human being. You're not looking for somebody that's going to fill the void. That's, so I feel like, yeah. I don't know, did that make any sense at all? Yeah, because it's the same thing as what, like, we're always saying like if you're at a hundred percent you're going to attract somebody also who's at a hundred percent but if you're at 30 percent and and someone comes along and then loves you at 40 percent you're gonna you're gonna be like wow that that's that's so good but it's literally like 10 percent right like you're yeah exactly and then of course it, it can't it's I just feel like you become codependent and then you live in misery for whatever how long the, the relationship is because no matter what the relationship with yourself is the number one well, more the most important relationship that you're gonna have what what did your mom always used to say everybody dies alone yeah you're born alone and you'll die alone that's what she used to yeah. say i mean a little morbid but incredibly <laughs> accurate right I mean, there's nobody, there's nobody in this life that you can depend on, like you can depend on yourself. That's right. So why not, why not take the time to kind of get to know that person and to, and to, you know, to make that person into a better version or like a more educated version of themselves, right? So like, that's going to help you, like we said earlier, in every aspect of your life, every aspect, it's going to help with your confidence, you know, knowing who you are to the core you know, that's when you see those people that are incredibly like this contagious confidence you know what I mean like just exude it like not cocky not arrogant but they're just so sure of themselves those are people that really know who they are those are people that have done some work exactly and, you know what like that's that's something that like it's they're not necessarily born with it like they've strived to be that person and you know good for them because it's not easy it isn't easy it, it, I always say like you know we have been conditioned and you have to understand like we've been socially conditioned just as you said with our parents get a good job get a good pension it's it's and then you know um 
there's also ex external conditioning that happens in schools like you're on a like a stream of like this is this is you have to decide who you are on that stream but nobody talks about like like choosing a, a path that you enjoy or nobody develops like I'm good at this but we're, no well is that going to make you money like that's the first thing right like so oh absolutely like the school system should be really, really, really trying to develop natural talent within individuals. Well, it's proven, like, you know, and as parents, you know, uh, you, we, we succumb to the same thing. You know, when a child brings home their report card, you, you skip all the good grades and go to the bad grade. Like, you know, but it's clear and evident where your, your child's strengths lie in that report card, right? But, yeah, there's. But we focus even, few even on jobs. Sorry. What what do they do? The first thing is tell me your strength. Tell me your weakness. Well, why do you care about my weakness? You know, like yeah. then put me like even I'm you know especially in a team, develop that per like let that person thrive with their strengths, and then who cares about their weakness? Then that's somebody who's who's that strength is you know some person. That's why there's teams. But it's just like we're so conditioned to focus. You have to be like, I guess, flat instead of, well, I excel at this, but yeah, I'm not so good at that. Like my son, he he is like, well, I always say he's a natural brain and he is, he really is a natural brain. I'm not just saying that because I'm his mom. I, you know, he's all, he, he had to be challenged in school academically because he was just, he got bored and which is why I put him in French immersion because just so that he wouldn't be bored because he was just excelling. And, you know, that leveled it off because he had to learn a different language that we is not our mother tongue. I don't know French. So he did that all on his own. But he would struggle in English because he said he didn't like it. But he would get like 90s chemistry, bio, biology, physics, math, you know? So that's his strengths. Like, so who cares, you know, if he had to work a little bit harder in English only just to keep the average up. But I even find that's even a disservice to his strengths. Like you don't need to be all rounded. We're not all rounded people. I, I, think, that's, I think that's the biggest thing um, that I want to touch on is societally we are designed to want to be well-rounded in every aspect and we're not circles it's, so exactly <laughs> it's, it's a very unrealistic goal and I mean it just goes to stem to the fact that nobody wants to admit that they have flaws like and I'm, I'm using air quotes here when I say flaws right because they're not flaws. It's just something that you don't naturally excel at. So, you know, take those strengths and run with them. If you can make a career out of something that you're naturally gifted at, you're going to enjoy that significantly more than something that, you know, you don't enjoy. And that you just you just went into. I mean, like, I, I, I'm not sure, but did your son go to school to be an English major? No. Nope. Like, I don't, th I don't think so, right? <laughs> I'm assuming he uses something along the lines of biology and chemistry. Yeah, he's in he's life actually... sciences, so. Yeah, so, <laughs> like, so, like, I mean, it makes sense, right? It's, I find it interesting, and you're very well, I mean, your, your point on employers is, is well hit, too, so, um, you know, you have to be well-rounded in, in every aspect, and it just doesn't really make sense when you're, you know, a team member, you know, if you excel verbally good for you you might not excel in the written word get somebody that's phenomenal written doesn't do well verbally pair them with somebody that's great verbally i mean it's a really simple like if companies want it design themselves to be able to use people running at 100 percent of their strengths all the time they'll be significantly more successful than trying to find one person one one rounded person to fit into a triangle peg, right? Like it's not going to work. Well, I when I was when it's I just was, such old school thinking. Yeah, when I was a training and development specialist on a team, I was 
I excelled at developing curriculum. Like I did, I like the training plans and the training, um, the actual presentations. Even my colleagues were like, I'll train anything Karen developed. And I liked doing it. I enjoyed doing it. It was my strength. And then my manager would say, yeah, but you have to train. And I, even though, yes, I was good at, I would, I would get good evaluations as well in terms of training and people were like, but you're so good at it. I don't like it. I don't like presenting material, right? Yeah, so now it's just a chore. Right, and it's, I find, I, and they, they say that, the test to see if you um, are good at something, because even if you, you might be good at something, but do you feel energized after you do it? That's the test. If you, if you come out of whatever you're doing, even if you're good at it, right? So like your job, you know you're good at it. You excel at it. But are you energized when you finish? Oh, no, I'm drained. Right. Like it takes every ounce of me. Which yeah. means it's not your passion. It does, Just because you're good at that's let's preface that by saying, just because you're good at something does not mean it's your passion. So those are the tests too. If you feel energized, great. Then that's your, you're good and it's your passion. Win-win. But I yeah. feel energized when I develop something and I see it to fruition and I see like people are at, can actually follow something and they're using it and, you know, they're happy about that. That invigorates me. But to present, like to, to develop and present, that's so draining to me. And it's so, so like, as an employer, I mean, now you're you're taking an employee that is gifted and doing well. So, like, you've had you had phenomenal critiques from you know yeah, other people employees. people who have to train that that exactly, they exactly. love so, training. They love training. exactly. And so, and now you're taking so you're taking somebody that's naturally gifted that's going to help set up the rest of the team, and you're putting them in an environment. That's going to drain them and literally sap the motivation out of them. That's what, she, and she says, this, this, she goes, you have to do both. And I'm like, no, there's a have to. Where, 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 the, on a tablet somewhere? Did Moses say that I have to do? Like, yeah, where, who's I mean, saying this? I don't, I don't understand. Like, this is, this is the, the thing that frustrates me is in a work environment is the lack of motivation, right? So, a lot of people lose motivation and there's there's no real nobody's really trying to motivate their employees effectively well it's if it's ineffective leaders right like because as exactly. a, a like, leader you should you should you should recognize that and you should use your team strengths and identify okay maybe they they need work on this but who cares we i don't need them to do that i have this person to do that like exactly so for, for me personally, there's nothing more motivating than being put in a role that I excel at. It's confidence inspiring. It's, you know, it's a lot. So like, if you're put in a role where like, you know, like, yeah, man, I got this. Like, that's very motivating when you're put in a position where, you know, it's not really something you want to do and you're doing it out of sheer obligation, you know, that brings out a lot of negative energy and a lot of negative thoughts. Like that's, that's just motivation zapping. So I'm really curious to see what happens over the next 15 years or so. I think there's going to be a very massive shift in the workforce. Well, it's happening now. Think, Aren't they saying, you know, they can't find employees because people are recognizing that this, this pandemic, um, a lot of staff, what well, the ones that actually kept their jobs and went remote and then now the employers are demanding that they come back to work when you know when it was convenient we worked from home and now you want to force us to come back to the office when now people are seeing the benefits of working remotely yeah no i agree i think there's going to be a it's not just that i think there's going to be a shift um, I think there's going to be a lot of old school ideologies that are going to slowly start disappearing. And I think some of the newer way of thinking is going to start creeping into the workforce. I would a hope bit. so, but... I, I'm in construction, so I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of tech out there, like tech companies where it's all new school thinking. Um, 
but honestly, like my dad can barely work a computer. So like, it's pretty, I think tech's a pretty young trade. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, like construction is a very old school mentality still. So like, I think once, you know, some of those guys start retiring, there'll be some, you know, younger ideologies popping in hopefully i think so but i just find we're always still so slow you know as a country to embrace because like people in europe have been doing this forever like this isn't new oh i know i know i know we're like western society is just all about the rat race or like even india even you know like even china like they've been doing remote forever and we are just like always the last to embrace. I feel even the States is probably even ahead of us in terms of technology and advancement. We kind of just kind of hold on until we're forced. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I always find it a little entertaining whenever somebody says Canada is a world leader in anything <laughs> because I feel like we're very much a follower. We're like, oh, we'll just hang back and see how this works in, you know, 10 or 15 other countries. And once they have a successful program, we'll kind of accept it, move it into ours and mess it up. You know what I mean? Like we're very, well, I feel like we're always 10 or 15 years behind everybody else. I, yeah. And, and, and I found out even, I was at a, an online uh, virtual conference last week and same thing the sad part even this is like a complete different topic but it was on dementia and technology and the doctor basically said that the reality is it takes 17 years um in this country from some to from research to be implemented like in policy and all of that stuff so there's a lot of red tape and bureaucracy so if you so in our in my and he said in in our lifetime we're not going to see any changes in dementia you know and that I, I find that i find that very interesting um given how you know not to get into this debate i really don't want to get into yeah. this debate but um how quickly when that red tape is removed how quickly we were able to get vaccines for covid um it seems like it's well, I guess little, even though I, it, I mean, I mean, I know they were working on vaccines for like SARS and stuff like that. So there was a lot of work already implemented into this. But it's very interesting how quickly the government can get stuff done when they actually need to get stuff done. Yeah, like and I how guess how slow they'll let stuff drag on during you know a normal kind of calendar year. And yeah, I was just gonna say it. It was a global pandemic, but then so is dementia. So you know. It is. I, I, I agree completely and I know it's I just find it very interesting how you know the red tape disappears and they're like oh no well, let's get some stuff done it's great good for them for doing it it's just interesting how you know everything else still takes forever like they you know they can move quickly they just choose not to kind of scenario yeah I guess well I guess because I, also too there is no cure so um, that is very that's a very good point very good point like yeah there's no vaccine there's no research that they've been working on this for over 100 years like it's you know so i think that's probably why like there's no cure so there's no sense rushing anything i guess that's what like, yeah. i'm assuming yeah, that's their rationale that makes sense. I mean, I you never you never want to see any kind of healthcare rush. You always want to make sure they do their due diligence on everything. But yeah, no, it's that's a that's a very valid point. But anyway, um, yeah, we've reached the one hour, so this is the longest. I, I, are, are we are we at one hour? I just pulled into my driveway, so I figured we're probably pretty close. But that's good though, because we haven't had one in a while. So I know it is good. It's really good. Okay, um, so we're gonna wrap it up. I'm going to stop. <laughs> that was a great talk on every topic, of which we usually get sidetracked. Yeah, that was, so that's that was good. a long part. Yeah, that's a little bit of everything. <laughs> All right. I'm going to end it now. Okay, see you next week. Bye, guys.